Call all hands. Beat the quarters. Run out the gun. Stand by this tavern battery. One broadside into her, if you please, Captain Bush. Pointers on target. Limb stops ready. Aye, aye, sir. Ready. Fire! <laughs> Michael Redgrave as C.S. Forrester's indomitable man of the sea, Horatio Hornblower. at home in time for Christmas. Feeling a trifle seedy still, of course, for somehow in following a French retreat from Riga, I, I picked up one of those illnesses which scourge armies on land. I had quite a bout of it, in fact. And then my old friend Captain Bush had brought me home aboard the Nonsuch. Home to Smallbridge, where the days passed quietly, serenely. Oh, wonderful days. But I, I began to want to see old Bush again. So not long after New Year's Day, we coaxed him down from London for a winter weekend with us. Uh, it was old times again. Well, now, uh, some port, what you say. Oh, oh, Wiggins right. has left it, I'm glad to see. Hmm? <laughs> you know, one night up in the Gulf of Riga, you seemed amused by a yarn of mine from my midshipman days, Bush. I, I, I never told you, did I, about my first independent command of what it led to in the way of, uh, <clears throat> well, self-knowledge. Uh, no. You know, extremely young men are rather, rather sad to contemplate, aren't they, uh, as one grows older? That terrible resolve that everything must turn out right. Their, their monstrous earnestness. <laughs> I hadn't been so long aboard the Indefatigable under Captain Pulio. I'd just come there as a gawky midshipman, you know, from the Justinian. And to have reached a frigate of the line had me oh, quite dazzled just then. We were on patrol in the Bay of Biscay, and we'd fallen on a convoy of French merchant ships, most opportunely. The French men of war, which should have been escorting them to Brest, were otherwise engaged that day for our own fleet to attack them miles further out in the Atlantic. And as the unescorted merchantmen fled towards home, filled with the food revolutionary France needed so desperately, Captain Pellew set out to capture as many as he could, snatching the prizes one by one. That French is too slow to surrender, Lieutenant Mason. Give her a shot across her bows from the nine powders. Aye, aye, sir. Not into a hull, confound it, Mason. I didn't mean that man. All I meant cripple her. Aye, aye, sir. That last one was dangerously near her waterline. Gun layers, change point of aim. Far into our rigging. Ready? Fire! Another one, sir? No, wait. Is it our flag coming down? Why, yes, I do believe it is, sir. High time it did. That last shot had good elevation. Ruined the sling to a tall topsail yard. Even the sail is down. All right, all right. That's he, too, close beside her. Have a broadside ready, Mason, in case she tries some trick. Give him a speaking trumpet. 
That'll sell for a pretty penny, sir, when we get her home to England. 200 tons, I should imagine, and 12 in our crew at most. Ah, yes. He'll need a prize crew of, uh, I'd say, four, eh? It's a midshipman's command. Now, uh, let me see. Uh, Mr. Hondler! <laughs> Don't want to go all the way overside, do you? Or are you trying to knock us all breathless, huh? Uh, uh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Never mind. I'm only joking. You're a featherweight. Why, it's young Hornblower. I thought the old man was sending down an officer. I, I suppose I was all, all that was left. I, or healthy, easiest to spare at this point, Mr. Ross. Uh, Full for the French brig, man. All right, sir. I think you can manage all right, Mr. Hornblower. Uh, yeah, sir. That French crew's likely to be nasty. Oh, uh, I feel sure, sir, that I, I, that I can. Yeah. Your first command, I suppose. Well, eh? well, yes. Still, it, it, it is a command in a way, isn't it? <laughs> Even if it's such a short voyage. Right? I hope it will be a short voyage, a Hornblower. You never know with a prize ship and prisoners. Watch that French crew. If you don't, they'll retake the ship and have you at a French jail before you know it. What English port are you heading for? Well, sir, I, I, I suppose whatever port's near is. <laughs> We both gazed up at the French brig as a cutter drew alongside. Struck by our fire, her fore topsail yard dangled precariously, and the jib halyard had slacked way off. The sail was flapping loudly in the wind. How many men will you want, Hornblower? Well, the, the captain told me to take four of your men, sir. They'd better be topmen, then. You'll have to get that jib in fast, or you will be in a bad condition. Aye, sir. Shall I pick four good men from you for my crew? They'd very much oblige if you would, sir. You know them better than I do. All right. Matthews? Aye, sir. Carson? Aye, sir. Hunter? Aye, sir. Smith? Aye, sir. Your detail to man this brig under command of Mr. Hornblower. Aye, 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 sir. <laughs> Keep them away from drink and they'll be all right. Well, here you are then, Mr. Hornblower. Watch out when you spring up those main chains. Lots of white water in between the two vessels, you'll notice. Here, Matthews, give Mr. Hornblower a hand there. On his other side. Wait for it, sir. Get ready. Now, jump, sir. I held myself up, all arms and legs, like a leaping frog at the brig's main chains. My knees slipped off, and the rolling brig lured me thigh deep into the boiling sea. But one of the seamen had preceded me. He, he grabbed up my wrists and hauled me aboard, and the three other seamen followed us. <laughs> a little the worse for wear, I led the way onto the deck. Well, men, we'll uh, reconnoiter a bit first. Aye, aye, sir. We'll be close in with you. Don't worry. Take care of yourself, Hornblower! Thank you, sir. I will. Uh, I don't see many signs of life aboard, I must say, Matthew. Men aft, sir. A little knot of them around that hatch cover, see? Oh, yes. Hand on my dirk, I advanced slowly aft. Suddenly, something was raised towards the sky above the heads of the crouching men. I halted and looked again. It, it was an up-tilted wine bottle. Hmm. They'd broken open the wine stores, were cheating their captors of them, at least, in as prompt and practical a way as possible. I, I couldn't really say I blamed them much. They've made the best of their time, sir. That's apparent. One of the group, his white hair blowing in the wind, rose to meet us. His lips seemed to be shaping some pronouncement of importance, searching earnestly for the right words to use. To the devil, Vince! The English! Put that bottle down. Do you hear, Frenchman? <laughs> I didn't need to remember Ross's warning. If I didn't solve this situation instantly, my boarding party would be at the wine along with this French crew. And a frightening picture rose up in my mind. A disabled ship drifting about the Bay of Biscay, manned by a tipsy crew. A quick show of authority was called for. Put it down, do you hear me? You understand English? If not, at least you can see that I'm armed. And here's my pistol. Put that down! He's obeying you, sir. Good for you, sir. 
Take these men forward, Matthews. You and two others. Lock them up uh, somewhere below. Aye, aye, sir. My first command, such as it was, and, and my first lesson in the loneliness that command brings to a man at sea. And suddenly, amidst these plans, a, a sickening thought struck through me. I, I rushed on deck to find Hunter. Hunter! Hunter, come here! Yes, sir. Hunter. What is it, sir? Look, it's, it, it, it occurred to me. Nothing's been done to see if the brig is taking in any water. You know, one of those shots we fired at her may have hulled her below the water line. That's so, sir. We'd uh, better sound the well. Not a drop of water on the rod. Dry as yesterday's pannikin. We can't keep the course you set much longer, sir. And the wind's coming up very gusty-like. Oh, very good. Well, I'll, I'll be up, Hunter. Call all hands at once. Aye, aye, sir. I disguised my inner feelings as best I could, but it was soon apparent with the wind northerly that we'd have to go about. All hands, where ship! Aye, aye, sir. With but four men to handle topsails and close haul the brig on the starboard deck, the task took all that was left of the night. By the time we brought her safely round, all hope of an easy two days' run had vanished. True, we were heading away from the dangerous shores of France, but we were also heading away from the friendly shores of England. That French captain's been yelping his head off, sir. Insists he's got to talk to you. Important. I'll release him, Hunter. Bring him up to me. My men, they are angry. Very angry. Uh, so are my men. I also. Uh, moi aussi. Uh, I, I have a cook. Good. Well, perhaps we can arrange a truce then, Captain. If your men are allowed on deck, your cook, to provide food for all of us, will you agree to make no attempt to take the ship from us? Of that we shall talk later, sir. There is another concern of more importance at this moment. Well? She rides a little heavily. Do you not think so? Heavily? Well, well yes, perhaps, but... Uh, uh, perhaps she leaks. Oh, no, no. No, oh, there's no water in her. We, we've tested the well. Tested the well? But, mon Dieu, you would find none in the well. Do you not know our cargo? Du riz, monsieur, du riz. What? We are carrying a cargo of rice. Cargo of rice? Why, yes, I recall now, but, but after all... Rice could... from New Orleans. No leak would be apparent in the well. No. Rice would absorb every drop of water in the hold. Yes, but... One shot from your cursed frigate struck us in the hull. Oh. Did you not know? Yes, well... I... Hunter! Hunter! Hunter, that, that shot hit her, after all. Where, sir? Well, I don't know yet. Must be somewhere on the port side for her, though. We, we'll have a look. You and Matthews put a bowl in round me and lowered away. We're heeling on this tack, and I'll have a good view over the side. The swaying of the brig, the sea closed over my head. But there it was, below the waterline, a splintered, jagged hole. It's the one more! It's the one more I told your notice to the deck seam forward there. What? It is opening. What? Hunter! Hunter, look, look. The pitch is even bulging out of it. And just beyond, sir, see that other spot. There's something awful wrong. Pitch coming in ridges from the deck seems... Oh, never... I have just thought. The rice. The rice. The rice. The rice. Can't go. Is, is that it? It falls bigger. What? Water's got well into it now, sir, so it's swelling. Dry rice that soak will double, even treble its volume. This ship will burst wide open with this cargo. Oh, mon dieu, mon dieu, mon dieu. I remembered the unnatural creaks and groans below, and I cursed myself for inexperience. A black moment. And if I hadn't spoken sharply, I'd have, well, I'd have broken down in tears. The sooner we get that sailor at right home, the better then. How do those French from our Hunter? Don't simply stand there staring. Aye, aye, sir. I said the ship was riding heavily. She's lower in the water already. Be Monsieur. silent, sir. One crisis after another. I have to think. How do you that sail? Do you hear me, man? Sir. I, I don't like the look of it. Straight I don't. She's settling down and opening up below as well as on deck. That rice is pushing her apart in every sea. Well, Matthews, I... I... Look, he there, sir. Even that battened down hatch cover's pushing upwards. See? Well, I... I'll jettison the cargo then, Matthews. 
Get some prisoners together and we'll start. Hunter! Aye, aye, sir! Take half your men off that sail work, open the hatches, and bring up the cargo fast. They all worked with a will, even the prisoners. And as they lifted off the hatch covers, brown forms shot out abruptly. Rice bags forced upwards by the pressure of others below. Bag by bag, the rice was hauled up from the hold and cast overboard. Sometimes the bag split, spewing rice in every direction. It was fantastic. And, and finally, the lower bags, wetter and more swollen, jammed the hatchway. Even the tackles won't sway them up now. Is that it, Hunter? Afraid so, sir. Oh. But we've relieved her quite a bit, I will say, sir. And the sail's ready. Good. Keep the rice party working to see if they can get rid of more cargo. Our lines row through the grummets of the sail. Oh, yes, sir. And a good five square feet of sail is followed. Oh, Put your other men to that, then. Um, work the sail under the hull and drag it after the hull. Aye, sir. Uh, begging your pardon, sir, what are you doing? Well, I'm undressing. I want to see it properly in place. And this time I'll go over without any clothes on, Hunter. Get a bowling ready for me. Call those men. Naked and wet, I lost a lot of skin. The ship was rolling most of this time, and, but I... I managed to see the fathered sail in place against the hole. A hairy mass sucked in instantly into position. The hole seemed fairly plugged, and, and they hauled me up. Well, sir, they got a few more bags out of the hold while you was gone. Good. I'm a... I'm a tall man, you can. Hunter, hand me that shirt, will you? Uh, she's riding better now. You notice, don't you, sir? Yes, and the wind's improving. We'll lay her on... Our original course, Hunter. No east by north. Aye, sir. Well, Bush, uh, another glass of port? Thank you, Horatio. But go on, please. Well, I was, I was limp with lack of sleep, with cold and exhaustion and accumulated burdens. And I, you know, I'd started with the highest of resolves and... Now, badly dampened. But at least I'd learned some lessons in that 24-hour span, and for the moment, all seemed well enough with ship and men. And as we plied heavily along, I even felt a, <clears throat> a tiny glow of pride, unearned or not. I squared my shoulders, and I took my stand there on the poop, straddling with my hands behind my back. I, I was still in command of my ship, Bush, such as she was, and... And despite the, the grinning fates and all my worries, she was heading home to England on a course I'd actually laid off myself. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, yes, very young and earnest men. Uh, they are a, a bit sad, you know. Huh? Yes, indeed. Well, Bush, finished your port? Yes. Well, mustn't keep my lady wife waiting, must we? Horatio Hornblower, starring Michael Redgrave, is based on the novels of C.S. Forrester. Music composed and conducted by Sidney Torch. Produced by Harry Allen Towers. <laughs>